This is Live from the Table, the official podcast of New York's world-famous comedy seller, coming at you on Sirius XM 99, Raw Dog. And on the Laugh Button Podcast Network, Dan Natterman here with Periel Ashenbrand, the producer. We have with us Mike Kaplan. Mike is a comedy seller regular. He's a comedian. He, is, he also has an album out called AKA. That's his latest album. His new album, I guess it just came out, Mike? Uh, yeah, it came out during the pandemic, so uh, the latest one possible. Does it t- have a lot of pandemic humor in it? Oh, no, yeah, I recorded it before. I recorded it in front of uh, un- unknowing audiences about what would come uh, in the future, but uh, yeah, released we, we, in uh, 2020. We don't have known with us yet. He's late. Where he is, we don't know. Could be anywhere. He could be with Mila, or Manny doing, you know, those are his kids doing something with them. I don't know. He should be here soon. Mike, how long on a related note do you think pandemic jokes will still be doable? Oh, I mean, I have some that I don't think are doable anymore, uh, you know, from from like a year ago, you know, some things, the, the current events from April of last year, uh, I think uh, had like a limited shelf life, though, maybe I feel like it could be like a retrospective now be like, you know, like what happened? I feel I, I guess I have no idea what the future is going to hold, but I'm trying to get back to not just doing jokes about uh, being afraid and in a room not leaving. I have a joke uh, about the gyms being finally open in New York City, which is already outdated because they've been open for months. But the jokes, the joke still works for whatever reason. I guess I sell it. I don't know how much longer I can, I can do it. <laughs> but I think the, the end is nigh as far as that joke is concerned. Oh, yeah. I mean, but, I, think... I think... More general jokes about the pandemic, a couple of years. I mean, it's a major event. You know, I mean, look, I, I mean, people tell jokes about, you know, I mean, Michael Jackson. I mean, that's a little stale, but they do it. Oh, yeah. Well... Yeah, people do September 11th jokes, I guess. I mean, it's a significant thing in history, so I guess you'd be able to do it for, you know, depending on the joke. Yeah, I think it depends. Is it the same joke? You know, like when, when Hillary Clinton was running for president, I feel like some comedians dusted off their Monica Lewinsky jokes because they had a, a new way. Oh, uh, Clint, the name Clinton's in the news, you know. So I think if you're, if you're writing new jokes, as, as you are, as most comedians are much of the time, you can write a great new joke about... Uh, you know, your, your Jim Gaffigan joke about uh, seeing the movie Heat five years after everybody else did and uh, wanting to talk about it then. I feel like that could happen for any joke topic. You know, you'd be like, oh, wow, I just came up with a great one about The Truman Show. Like, it, if it's it's all about, you know, you and how connected you are to it, it doesn't ha- you don't only have to tell jokes about what's happening literally. Really, right now. As far as the Truman Show is concerned, I think that might be pushing it a little bit, simply <laughs> because I mean, Gone with the Wind. You can talk about because it's uh, it's a, you know it's a part of the American landscape and 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 still controversial. But the Truman Show, I think, has been largely forgotten. Well, I be wrong about that. Let let me offer you. This is a sincerely a thing that I learned about the Truman Show or discovered. Uh, in the past year or two. So I think the movie came out about 20 years ago. Uh, and I feel like you're, you're familiar with it. You saw it. You, you know the general. I know the general idea. Uh, it only, I'm, you know, I'm more than 40 years old now. I was about 20 when it came out. And it, was, it took two decades for me to realize that they, his name is Truman because he was the one true man in the town that he lived in. And uh, I went for decades without realizing that. And I feel like that is a joke. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily even a joke, but it's a, a concept. It's, a joke. it's an idea. Yeah. yeah. And it's about me and my ignorance more than the movie itself. So I feel like uh, as long as anyone you, do all the 9-11 jokes you want, do all the pandemic jokes you want, as long as it's about my ignorance, I think it'll work. You have to have heard of the event. Yes, so that's the, true. The point I was making is, is the Truman Show a universal reference that pe- people know, especially younger people. That I, the, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I, certain movies like The Godfather, you know, they, 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 they stick around in the consciousness. I don't know if the Truman Show is one of those movies, but in any case. Yeah. I mean, I had a joke years ago about the movie Final Destination, and I, I know that a lot of people... 
I, I'm sure that most people haven't seen the movies, even though they might be, you know, passingly familiar with it. But the joke that I wrote was it was sort of required that you know what happened in the movie. So I just sort of built in uh, a telling, uh, like a brief summary of like, yeah, here's can, what you I, need. You can tell, you, I think it takes away a little bit from the punch of the joke if you have to explain explain things like that. But you can that, that's always a possibility. Oh, yeah. No, I did it in a very funny, innovative, uh, impressive way. But uh, yeah, for other people. Yes. I, I should mention that the Comedy Cellar, and we talked about this last week, but now it, we are officially back at 100% capacity with vaccination cards. You have to present your vaccination card to get in, but, but, uh, but we are at 100% capacity here. Um, Mike, have you played here since the 100% capacity? It's only been since Monday, actually. Uh, yeah, I came. In, I came by and did. I did new jokes on Monday, but uh, previously I was in the Village Underground on Sunday, so I got the last, the tail end of the slightly under hundred percent capacity. But uh, Duran Duran song, new jokes on Monday. Oh, uh, I don't know if I know. I don't know if Duran Duran. No, no, I was kidding. I'm, it was New Moon on Monday. <laughs> uh, I think that the Truman Show is more universally accessible than that Duran Duran song. It may be so. That may be so. I don't know. I mean, I'm an 80s kid, so, you know, to me, that song is, is still very much with me. But, um, yeah, I was here on Monday. It was a, a kind of exciting. Um, as excited as I get. You know, I've, I've been doing this long <laughs> enough that nothing's exciting anymore. But it was exciting. And it, Oh, Noam is here. Will it, should we admit him or not? I don't know. <laughs> we, we need him. I mean, I also recently got into an argument with him. Hello, so nice of you to join us. I literally, literally just got into an argument with him about how he's never late for anything. And he was telling me that I'm always late. No, I, th I thought it was 7.30. I got confused from last week when we started late. No, Mom, we're talking about the seller being back at full capacity. I call it maximum capacity. That's maximum capacity <laughs> with a vaccination card presented at the door. Do you have any thoughts? Are you happy to be back? Are you, does anything get you excited anymore? I was saying for me, it's, it's harder and harder to do. I had a bad day at home today. I'm, I, I'm, I'm in no mood to do this podcast. Uh, I, I, uh, I had, yeah, I'm very happy. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that the cellar is open again. I mean, it's fantastic, right? Um, it's, I, I need to make a living. It's great. Comedians need to work. Are you happy, Dan? Uh, I'm not going to uh, redress the the you needing to make a living uh, point. Um, Why? You think, what do you think? I don't need to make a living? <laughs> I, I think that, uh, I, I think you could probably, you know, squeak by. For what, forever? Without maybe, not, maybe not forever, but for a while. But I could be wrong. You're an idiot. Do you understand <laughs> how much money goes out every month when we're closed? Rent, utilities, bills, insurance. It's crazy. Three kids, a yeah. wife, a house. Well, in any case. Um, what do you think? He never has to work again? Uh, I don't know about never has to Are work. Are you one of those people tweeting Jewish privilege on, on, on Twitter? <laughs> um, Hashtags. Um, anyway, yes, it's, uh, well, I was saying to Mike, it was fun, but, you know, I, what is Mike doing here? Is he going to complain about Israel now? Is that, is that, is no, that what we'll, we, we'll get to that. May, we may or may not get to that. There are a couple of interesting things happening this week. We, you can choose the topic. Choose your own adventure style. We'll do this. Wait, you know? I just want to say one thing. That was not the intention in inviting Mike. The intention in inviting Mike was that he is smart enough to hang with the invited guests. But also Mike runs left and it's always nice to have yes. somebody that has a different perspective because Noam tends to run middle right. I tend to run middle right. And Periel, uh, she's all over the map. Oh, crazy left. <laughs> but but uh, Noam, the two, two, two interesting news stories this week. Number one, Google, the Google diversity chief or whatever they call him, apparently tweeted some, or not tweeted, but had a blog post uh, about in 2007 where he said if he were Jewish, he would be well, I, I had. Do you have the? Do you have the the, the talking points? Because sure. like he said, the Jews were war were warlike people or something, right? No, that's not a direct quote, but that's, that's not a direct a, quote. That's I'm a sorry. reasonable, uh, a reasonable uh, paraphrase. Well, the other story is a valedictorian in Texas 
was going to do a valedictorian speech that was pre-approved. She had to get her speech approved by the school officials. And at the last minute, she substituted a speech about the new uh, anti-abortion law in Texas. So those are the two topics. That well, let's take the first one. So he's, I'm looking at, he says, Jews have an insatiable appetite for war. <laughs> uh, that, was, that, was, that was pretty close. Well, let, let, me, let me get the precise quote. Well, could you please call it? Okay. That's His a precise, precise quote. quote was, if I were a Jew, I would be concerned about my insatiable appetite for war and killing in defense of myself. So and insensitivity to people suffering, yeah. Self-defense is undoubtedly an instinct, but I would be afraid of my increasing insensitivity to the suffering of others. My greatest torment would be that I've misinterpreted the identity offered by my history and transposed spiritual and human compassion with self-righteous impunity. And he also wrote that the Jewish experience with the Holocaust ought to have given rise to sympathy and compassion for the oppressed. So I don't know what the latest is, whether he's been fired or he's made an apology that he may or may not uh, be sincere. I don't know. Listen, this is the thing. I mean, the, the, I know Mike's being, Mike's being really quiet, but it's not surprising because, you know, I felt this way a long time. I mean, nothing's 100%, but isn't it, a, isn't it, a, is it a coincidence that a guy like that is a diversity chief? No, not, not in my mind, because so much of, of what this is, is not about, um, uh, you know, the, 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 this is, the world that we'd like to live in where everybody's treated the same, a lot of what is uh, dressed up as intersectionality and equal rights and all that stuff is, is just, you know, racist hate and resentment. And it's, and it's put in a Trojan horse package of, of righteousness as if we're just trying to do right. But if you, if you look at the, the you know, the basic anti-racism tracts, I mean, they're, they're filled with the idea that it's okay to judge people by the color of their skin. And, so, and once you've normalized treating people by the color of their skin, of course, people be, just become extremely comfortable with anti-Semitism. Like, you know, once, once it's like, I mean, people are going to say, believe me, I'm not offended as a white person. As a matter of fact, I think all the Jews here, even Mike Cavill will agree, we don't feel white. We don't have any allegiance to, to white people. We're offended that they want to lump us in as white. But you know, when, when it's so normal, that white people this, white people that, and Karen, and, and just, you know, and just talking bad, and white males, and blah, 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 you know, all of it, you just normalize the whole idea that it's okay to judge people by their immutable characteristics. So then why not the Jews? I mean, why, 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 we've already broken any principle opposition to bigotry, right? I mean, there's no, what's the, princi what's the principle against bigotry? Mike, you must have something to say about that. Uh... Oh, well, uh, I'm, I guess I, I'm against bigotry. And uh, the, uh, the, I, what's, I don't really understand the question of what's the principle, uh, the last question that Noam asked. No, if, I'm saying that if you, if you're, what I'm saying is that if you, if, when, when I was a kid, the principle was obvious. My, my kids could understand it, which is it's unfair to judge people by their immutable characteristics. That's, that's, you can't, you can't judge somebody by something that's, they have no choice in. But then when, you know, when the mayor of Chicago says, shut up, Karen. Well, okay, well, I, you know, you could say that it's not as harmful because- um, Well, isn't, aren't people judging Karens by their actions? No, she, she, just, she just used it as, a, as an all-purpose slur against a, a white person who disagreed with her. Oh, but, but, origi but I think the original meaning of a Karen was somebody who was like a white lady unreasonably calling the cops on a black person. That's like taking an action. So the name Karen was given for an action. I'm not saying that I would do it or that it's the right it's thing to if, do. It's as if I took uh, OJ, who was a murderer, and started calling black people OJs. I mean, you, you can't. But I mean, whatever the original thing of Karen was, it, it became, it, it's become very socially acceptable to just bash groups like i said it, it the the there is no principle anymore the principle went from it's wrong to judge people by the color of their skin to it's wrong to judge certain people by the color of their skin and then you heard the argument as a matter of fact if you're not white you can't be racist you've heard that argument meaning that you're what does that mean so it means that you're entitled to judge people it's you're morally you're morally uh, exempt. You can you can ju you can hate oh. people because of the color of their skin. I, I actually well, don't think that right. that's you're not a racist. No, I think that when people say that you can't be racist if you're not white, 
It's that their definition of racism is that racism is prejudice plus power, which means that the pa- if the power is lacking, then you cannot be prejudiced plus power. But it is not that you cannot be no, hateful. I, I, totally, I totally reject that because I've, I've heard that. I mean, you're being accurate about what they're saying. First of all. So you reject that, my accuracy? No, I'm telling you what I reject. I, I rejected that it's sincere, not, in, not that you're being sincere, but when they say it is sincere, because first of all, that's not the definition of racism. But second of all, what you don't hear them say is, yes, that is a foul person right there. I wouldn't call them racist because they're not in power. Nevertheless, they're disgusting. In other words, it, it doesn't just become a, a, a semantic thing. Well, it's not quite racism, but it's, it's still racial hate or whatever you want to say. They use it to exempt I was like, well, if, I, if I were to complain about, did you hear what that, my wife's Indian, did you hear what that brown person said about the Jews? And I say, that's racist. They, they will say, well, no, she, that can't be racist. They won't say, yeah, that's horrible what she said. I don't think you're using the right word, but that's fucking disgusting that she would say such a thing about somebody based on the color of their skin. They don't well, say that. Well, I'm not sure that. who the they, they is that they you're do, talking about. Anybody, anybody, I've never heard anybody say that argument that you're referring to. Not once did they ever follow that argument with, but by the way, you're absolutely right. That was a disgusting thing to say. They never, it always is used as a total forgiveness of the foul. I don't have another word but racism. You know, if, if, they, want, if they want to redefine it, then they have to leave me with a word to describe what it is when a homeless person kicks the shit out of a Jewish person. And they want to say, well, that wasn't because and said, you dumb fucking Jew when he's doing it. And you say, well, that's not racism. Okay. If you want to tell me he's not racism, then just tell me what it is. You know, I, I don't know. No, no, I'm um, Professor Gerson is here, but I, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to ask you, uh, okay. So this man in 2007 made a blog post saying what he said, this uh, Google diversity guy, uh, now, I, I'm pretty sure that you are against, would be against him being fired for that. Is that correct? Um, I'm against people being fired for their political points of view. I, I'm not against somebody being fired if, you know, if, if their view is incompatible with their you know, being taken seriously at, on their job. So, I mean, like if you, if you have a diversity counselor let's let's take a different like a diversity counselor who says such things about black people like just to make it easier we'd say well no you you can't be you know you can't be in charge of diversity and actually turn out that you hate black people i i get that um so there are you know it's it's not all but in general yeah in general i would like to see people no longer fired for what they believe in because i think the the slight gain from time to time is totally outweighed by all the all the boneheaded injustices. What about the fact that this blog post was from 2007? With, um, I mean, should there be sort of some sort of um, amnesty, on, a general amnesty on on all internet uh, posts, you know, prior to a certain date? Or I mean, yeah, yeah in general, the, the only thing about this case, I think, which makes it harder in my trying to be fair-minded, in, in my mind, it's, I know. It's, you're going to think it's because it was about the Jews. It's really not. And you, you guys know, the listeners might not, but I've defended tons of people who said things about the Jews. I don't want to see them fired. But in this case, because the job is somehow overseeing the elimination of racism, as it were, like it's, it's, diver- it, it's hard for me. I, I have to take it more seriously. But yeah, 2007 is a long time. And I, you know, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not calling for this person's head. I'm more, I'm more interested in, in the rank hypocrisy of it all. So for instance, there is this Twitter hashtag now, Jewish privilege. And if you, and if you browse Jewish privilege hashtag, it's the most vile anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, you know, and I made a joke, like if we, re, if, if we didn't control the media, maybe somebody non-Jewish would have the nerve to write about it. But because, because we're in charge of all the things, no, we, we, we don't complain enough, but the fact is that if you replace that hashtag with black privilege or Asian privilege and you wrote all these horrible things about Asians and black people, Twitter would take it down, you know, in a hot second. But no, somehow, I've never said that about the Jews before, that we don't complain well, about. That is okay, incredible. We have a professor here, and she's very important. Well, so let's, let, me, uh, let me introduce her, fold her into the conversation. Please. This is Jeannie or Jenny? Jeannie, I guess. Jeannie Suk, is it Suk? Suk? Jeannie Suk Gerson. 
So Jeannie Suk Gerson, is that correct, the pronunciation? Yes. She is a law professor at Harvard. Very impressive. Um, <laughs> but we'll, 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 yeah, I'm getting to that, Periel. I know how to read. Uh, sorry, there's a little <laughs> a dispute amongst us. It doesn't concern you. Uh, she's also a contributing writer to, I know, I think one of Noam's favorite publications, The New Yorker. My father was one of my father's favorite pu publications as well. Um, in fact, he, he, he put, you know, they, ah, never mind, it's a long story. Go ahead, Dan, anyway, go ahead, don't let Perry Not saying like uh, The New Yorker, like they say, like you can, if you've been a long time subscriber, you can add somebody else. You can get somebody that you know a subscription. And so he got me a subscription and I never read it. But anyway, Jeannie- Did you ever, started, do, you ever do the caption contest, Dan? You'd be good at the caption contest. I, don't I wrote a Shouts and Murmurs once oh, okay. that oh, got rejected. It was about, Shouts and Murmurs is like their witty, you know, fiction section. And I wrote one about a guy going to, I kind of don't remember it that well, but I think it was a guy going to heaven and the official language there was Spanish. Um, something like that. That doesn't and, sound like fiction. Uh, yeah. All right, so go ahead, Dan, finish your introduction. Yeah, I'm, the introduction is finished, so. <laughs> So, so Jeannie, Jeannie, we were talking obviously about this guy, Kamau Bob, I believe his name was, that tweeted, or not tweeted rather, but this was, I guess, prior to Twitter, 2007, or right around the time Twitter came out. He had a blog post saying that the Jews are uh, warmongers or whatever. They're calling for his head anyway. I don't know if you want to just continue that discussion, Noam, or if you want to- uh, Maybe we, we can circle back to it. Something else. So I, I was very, um... I was very taken with an article that Professor Gerson had written about the Chauvin case a few weeks ago. But now we're so far away from the Chauvin case. I, I, I do have only one question I want to ask you about Chauvin. Then, I want, then I'd like to ask you about the politics of bad sex, if that's okay. Okay. It's okay. So on the Chauvin case, leaving aside all of it, can you explain to us, because I've been having some debates, what is the difference between but-for causation, which... Um, uh, you know, just means that if it wasn't for this, this wouldn't have happened. I think that's, and, and the standard in the Chauvin case, which was a um, um, substantial factor. Is that, the, is that what it was, substantial factor? What does substantial factor mean in causation? So, but for is, I think that's pretty intuitive, right? right. But for this, it wouldn't have happened. But um, for my parents having had sex, I would not exist. Correct. Therefore, your parents um, are liable for anything that any crime you commit under the but for rule. Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but generally, for legal causation, for something to be considered caused by something in the law, you have to have both but for causation and something that we generally call proximate causation um, or legal causation. So. Um, so in, in the state in which this uh, crime took place, um, you do have to have but for causation, but you also have to show, um, and, and in that state, they call it substantial factor, um, which means that it doesn't have to be the only factor, but that it, it's something that contributed substantially to something coming about. So that's what is meant by substantial factor. And I, I think it, that too seems pretty intuitive in that the pressing of the knee on um, the neck of George Floyd um, was, substan was a substantial factor. It contributed does, does to it the also, death. If I could just jump in, does it also have to be foreseeable? In other words, if I invite Noam to my house, he has an accident on the way over. Uh, that's a pretty substantial factor that he got into the accident that I invited him to my house. But obviously there's no crime. So, so it, it seemed to me that foreseeability or, or intention uh, would have to be included in this. Right, so yes, um, it can't be just completely out of the blue. Like there's, there's no connection. That, but reasonable foreseeability is is one of the things that goes into the idea that something is a substantial factor. So it, um, it's true that if someone comes over to, you invite someone over to your house and they get into an accident, you didn't do anything wrong, right? Because you didn't have any intent or you didn't have any recklessness or negligence or any kind of like guilty mental state with respect to somebody getting into an accident. 
But here in, in the Derek Chauvin case, um, there was, there was uh, some amount of recklessness or negligence in using the knee on the neck. So there, it wasn't like it was a completely innocent state of mind, even if you don't have to prove necessarily that the intent was to kill. Okay, but, but this is where- Reasonable foreseeability is the, is, the, is, the, is the factor that I was getting at. So, so this is where I'm really confused because I've heard it described in exactly the opposite way. I've, I, I, I spoke to a law professor who has a friend of mine who, who laid it out for me actually just as you have just now. But then, for instance, I think Laura Bazelon was on our, our, our podcast and she described the substantial factor as being a less rigorous test than but for. And then I, so I looked it up, for instance. It is. Right. Well, so for instance, in, um, I, I, in some, some things I looked up online, it says the substantial factor test, sometimes a, platen, a plaintiff would likely have gotten injured regardless of the defendant's actions. And then also um, it gives... Um, an example of, uh, 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 this is in a Cornell, I think, Law Review article, it says, um, classic example, of, well, so there's, a, there's a, I'm trying to rush and I'm not being clear, but there's a kind of a classic hypothetical in law school, where like if a, if a firing squad, everybody fires on one person and you can't, you can't trace who, who mm -hmm. actually shot the bullet that killed somebody. So would you let them all off, right? Because you can't prove it. And it says some courts, however, have tried to solve the problem uh, related to but for cause. Some courts use a substantial factor test, which states that as long as the defendant's actions were a substantial factor in a crime, then the defendant would be found guilty. So in the firing squad example, all the members of the firing squad, all of the members would be found guilty. However, this test creates a problem. So, so what this seems, as I read those things, it seems like a workaround to the but for test. So like when we're really not sure we have but for causation, we have this substantial factor test. So is that just a difference between civil and criminal law there? So in general, uh, usually, usually you have to have both but for and the other kind of causation that sometimes is called proximate cause. Sometimes people call it reasonable foreseeability. Sometimes people call it uh, substantial factor or legal causation. And it's the, the latter one, it, it's, it's just more nebulous. Often what I, the way I think of it is just, it's a way of, it's like a placeholder concept for our moral intuitions about right. who is responsible. So at the end of the day, you can parse it and have all these hypotheticals about, you know, about 10 people shooting at someone at the same time and all of that. And but at the end of the day, when you see what courts do, what juries do, it really traces to their moral intuitions about who is responsible for the result. And so more than these technical kinds of hypotheticals, I think what's more predictive of whether causation is going to be found is whether people think this person is morally responsible for the death. And ultimately, that's, that's what it, it tends to track. Right. So I, that, that sounds now you're now what you're saying now is closer to what the feeling that I've been getting. But does does that mean that you can convict somebody of murder? Even if you're not sure the person wouldn't have died anyway. Is, is that what is that what that means? You don't have. Can you is it a workaround against reasonable doubt? This is you know, this is really troubling me. So, so for instance, you know, I know what a substantial factor in heart disease is because you can say, well, if you didn't, if you didn't have that diet, uh, you might have gotten worse heart disease. You might have gotten, uh, gotten it sooner. You might have a different type of heart disease. It can be a factor. And you can still say, well, even if you hadn't had the diet, you still have the heart disease. But this diet was a substantial factor in what you've gotten. I, I have trouble transposing that to a binary situation where you're either alive or you're dead because... You can't make somebody more dead or less dead. So the question in my mind is, and this goes to the Chauvin thing, this substantial factor it almost seemed like the jury could say to themselves, well, there was drugs and there was this and there was that. And I don't really need to know that this killed him. As a matter of fact, even if he, even if he had died, even if he might have died without this knee on his neck and back, um, my moral intuition still thinks this is so outrageous. I think he's guilty of murder. 
That's, that's, that's fraught to me. That's scary to me. Yeah, I don't actually think that that is what is um, entailed. I don't think that that is what we're opening up to, that you, you're, you're not sure he would have died but I'm still going to go ahead and say that, that this person is responsible. No, it really is that, um, that there are multiple causes, right? So, so the drugs could have been, maybe you can't, out, you can't outright rule out the drugs having contributed or um, pre-existing conditions having contributed. All of those are contributing factors, but another contributing factor, a substantial factor was the knee on the neck. That's what, that, that's what is meant. It's really not that, oh, he would have died anyway at that moment without the knee, but we're still going to, to, to convict him. No, no, no. I do not think that, that uh, that's a bridge too far, as, as you are saying, and I agree with that. I do not think that that is how causation works or would be explained to the jury. If, if the jury were to, to say that and, and in their deliberations, that's what happened, that would be an error. So, so, I mean, then we'll, then we'll move on. So, I mean, just the, just the idea that the standard is nebulous and I can speak to Harvard law professors and other people and, and I'm like, well, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not very, very, it's, it's not easy to pin down and one person's definition of substantial might be another per, not be another person's definition of substantial. And we're gonna, we're gonna convict people, could even have the death penalty conceivably on this kind of thing. And, and if, if I went to law school, you, you're a law professor. If we're like having trouble pinning it down, like how are these jurors going to be able to pin it down? The whole thing makes me uncomfortable. I, I, and I read, I'm, I not gonna, I'm not going to waste anybody with the jury instruction, I mean, but the jury instruction look, is also you. nebulous. Yeah. Look, I hear you, but I think that possibly this is because you probably don't spend a huge amount of your time looking at jury decisions and and trials a huge amount of but, but here with the dark children we had we were all really focused on it and so what you're what you're really realizing is just how i mean it's, i almost feel like saying to you welcome to the law <laughs> because sometimes people who aren't lawyers think well law is precise and law is about you know you know exact exactitude and about drawing straight lines that you know one's either you're, you're either on one side or the other side and, and it's very clear that's just not the law. That's not how law works. I mean, most of the time, law works through these standards that are not precise. And then you get a whole bunch of lay people, namely juror, jurors. And in part, we want them because they're not lawyers, so yeah. that they will imbue the decision with the moral intuitions that are harder to make precise. I went to law school too, and it took me about two years of law school to realize that, that, to realize what you're saying, I, you know, like I would go through, com I would read Supreme Court decisions and try to figure out, well, why, I don't understand why they decided this way. And then after two and a half years, I realized, oh, now I know why, because they don't know what they're doing. Because it's man-made and it can be anything. Just like when people discuss the plot of a movie and they say, well, why did he, why was he in this scene? Was he wearing a bathrobe? But in the previous scene, he had a knife and then, no, the answer is because the screenwriter fucked up. Um, if so I I'm may, gonna, yeah. But, but I, we're, we're, we want to pivot from- wait, 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 okay, can, can we, can we, can this is really, I'm still, I'm still trying to get it. So I'll read the first sentence of the jury. This is kind of interesting. Let's, let's just, let's just breathe. No, I thought you wanted to talk about sex, which is more near to yeah. our listeners on raw dog. <laughs> no, yeah. no I'm, you're just gonna, you're okay. gonna have to stop kneeling on people's necks just in case. Okay. Uh, 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 oh. It says, um, I don't think that's too much to ask. No, it's not too much to ask. It says, this is the, the actual jury instruction. To cause death, causing the death, or cause the death means that the defendant's acts or, act or acts were a substantial causal factor in the causing of the death of George Floyd. Now, can, can we think of a, an example where something is a sub, substantial does that mean that it, it like I'm trying to I'm just trying to say what that means. It means it's it see the way the way it sounds to me is that what you did in combination of other things could lead to death. Yeah. But to me as just a, a lay reading of that instruction, it sounds like it means if it weren't for him doing that, he wouldn't have died. They should say that. <laughs> That's what the instructions should be. 
I don't know what a substantial, like if there's three different things and any two of them would cause the death, including the, including the two, but not your, your factor in it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, it's, it's confusing to me. Let's say he had, okay. he had drugs, so he had heart disease, he had the knee on his neck. Uh, what if the right. drugs and the heart disease would, would have killed him? And I, I mean, if, okay, if the drugs and the heart disease alone yeah. would have killed him, Chauvin would not have been convicted because that is, that does not count as causation. So what I'm saying is you have to have both, but for causation, right? As in, but for means without you, without Chauvin, he's alive, at least for a while. Right. Um, and in addition to that, you have to have this substantial factor satisfied as well, which means that, that you are instruction for the jury. I'm sorry. But no one wants to know if that was the instruction. Well, I, I read the instruction. I, I mean, that's it. I mean, it talks about superseding causes. I mean, I get it. I, I understand the concept very well as a, as a lower end thing, meaning like, well, it's not just enough that it's but for causation, but it can't also be like, a, it can't be like you stepped on his toe and therefore that was the, that straw that broke the camel's back. Can't be such an insubstantial factor. That, that I, I get it as a lower right. limit. But to, if you tell me, was, was this, was it, did it contribute to the death? What I feel like is that it, it, rather than saying as the first sentence of the jury instruction, the defendant's action must have caused the death. Additionally, it, it should not have been so insubstantial, you know, because, because what I think it, it does is, is, is blur it up so they don't realize, or they're not disciplined to asking themselves, do we know he wouldn't have died from the drugs? Because let's just go into the case for a little bit. There were these three experts. There was Tobin, right, who said this would have killed anybody, even a healthy person. There was this other guy, I forget his name, was kind of in the middle, who said, you know, it was, it was positional asphyxia plus all these conditions. And then there was Baker who, ident who, who, um, exa who examined the body, who said, actually, it's, it's not positional asphyxia at all. It was the stress of everything. And, but, but what was interesting to me as a, as a watcher was that, well, actually, the first opinion and the third opinion were mutually exclusive. You, you couldn't believe. So the prosecution had, had made their case by presenting me with two experts who could not both be correct. Rather than getting three experts who kind of spoke with the same voice, they gave me two competing um, accounts of how he died, which one of them had to be false. And I'm like, well, if you give me two experts and they're mutually exclusive, that to me is reasonable doubt right there. Like that to me, that's it. Like you're the prosecution. If you're, if you are, if you're gonna tell me that, that your expert can disagree diametrically with your other expert, but I'm supposed to still think you've proved this beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm like, well, no, that's not the way the mind normally works. If I go to two doctors and they give me two completely opposite opinions, I don't, I can't say that either of them is correct. I might, I might have my gut feelings, you can't have but you have to prove. And like if they had gone to Baker and said, who said, you know, there was a, that was a, could have been a lethal amount of fentanyl. He just found it was um, much less likely that, that was the word he used, much less likely. If, 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 if that guy Nelson had, had the courage to say to Baker, listen, how do you know he didn't die of fentanyl overdose? Baker, I believe, would have had to say, well, I don't really know that. It just really seems really unlikely to me. And really unlikely to me does not seem like proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I find his, I mean, I'm happy the guy is uh, in jail and, I'm, and I hope justice was done, but Something about this causation thing is, is just been bothering me and bothering me. I don't know. What do, you, what do you think, Professor? It seems like if you had been on the jury, you might have been the reason that the jury hung. <laughs> not if I, not <laughs> but, if I lived know? in Minnesota. If I lived in Minnesota, I would have, I would have said but guilty. The, <laughs> but, you know, I, I have to say, I, I guess I disagree with you. I just, I, I think, you know, it, I think there's a good reason that 12 people unanimously thought, you know, that they're, that, to them, they watched the video, they heard the experts. And um, what you're saying about the conflict, the potential tensions between the prosecution experts, sure, that could happen. But there is nothing wrong with pre presenting alternate theories of how 
something happened. That happens all the time in trials. It may be a bad strategy because like you're saying, a jury may not buy it. They, it may confound them and, th and they may get confused or think, wait, if the prosecution can't even get its story straight, how likely is it that they are correct? And that could be a reason to introduce reasonable doubt, but that is not logically necessarily a reason to vote to acquit because you could say they presented two theories. I buy one of them. I don't buy the other one. And this ultimately you're trying to get at the truth. You're trying to get the jury to have their own account of how it happened. You can offer multiple possibilities. Yeah, well, and that can, does sometimes happen. That, I, I that the prosecution that. says, you know, it could have happened this way or it could have happened that way. I, I get that. And, and I would say that um, the jury certainly can decide to buy one or the other especially in matters that they can bring their common sense judgment and experience to. Not so much in two scientists. I think to me, I, like, like zooming out for a second, I would just say, okay, that's the prosecution. If they couldn't find two experts to say the exact same thing, I have to worry. Some, something is going on there. If I, if, I, if I have a medical ailment and I go to four different doctors and I can't get two doctors say, no, no, Mr. Dorman, it's definitely this. Well, that I, happens I, a lot I, of the like, time. No, I, and, I, they, that, but that, they're all telling you you're going to die. You're going to die. Yeah, yes, but that's not, that's that happens I, all the time. That you're like, you might have celiac disease or you might be having a stroke or you might, you know, at, but the bottom yeah. line is your symptoms are your symptoms and you're feeling bad. But they have, yes, but, but here they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, the causation. So it can't be, so you have, you can't just be like, I'm happy with either theory. Right. You have the to problem, say. The issue is, is the doubt, it sounds like you have doubt. And the question is, is your doubt reasonable? And the jury probably thought, look, there are some doubts here and probably raised some of the issues. And they thought, well, but the doubt is, it's not reasonable. You have unreasonable doubts, Noam. I, uh, I mean, I think if this was if this was a more sympathetic defendant, people would see my argument with a lot. That's more correct. Sympathy. I, I, I agree with you. A lot, yeah, of, he, a lot of politics. But if they had a defendant who hadn't knelt on a guy's neck, yeah. Yes, with a video that looked absolutely gruesome and brutal. And the bottom line is that is why we have juries to bring their common sense yeah. of the matter into it and listen to the experts, but not completely defer to them. No, I try to be as objective as I can possibly be, like just forgetting everything about the politics, everything, like everything about the issue, because you're supposed to do that. We're not supposed to bring any of that into the, the courtroom. And I'm saying that when, when, when one medical expert has a mutually exclusive opinion to the other medical expert, and by the way, the one we don't believe is the one who actually, ident who actually examined the body and does it for a living, and the one we're going to go with is the one who never even saw the body. Um, that's a troubling, that is a troubling uh, uh, outcome to me. I mean, like, just as, as, a, law, as a law school hypothetical. Maybe, just to summarize. Maybe, maybe you should. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, maybe they'll be calling you for, for consultation on the appeal. I was going to say, listen, I, I'm happy he's in jail. He, I mean, he... he if he if he if he wasn't actually responsible for this guy's dying, it's not for lack of trying. I mean, this guy's got his knee on his on his back or in his neck, and long after anybody can make any argument for wanting him to have his knee on his back, his partner even said, "Hey, shouldn't you let him uh, turn over?" So if he didn't kill him, it's only because he's the luckiest guy in the world, and and Chauvin died of a of a drug overdose or something. Uh, and now something. you're really sounding like any doubt there that would be unreasonable. No, because anyway, because no. Listen, let me, I'll tell you, this is the, so you know that Sick Nick case, that guy, the guy no, who died, yeah. so Sick Nick, for those who are going even deeper into the weeds here. No, no, this is really interesting, because this is a very important this example. Not sex bureaucracy. Okay, just last thing. So Sick Nick is this guy, who was a um, federal uh, police officer, whatever you call it, trooper, and uh, he was first, the, the, he died the day after the January 6th insurrection riot, whatever you want to call it, and the first story was they got hit by, over the head with a fire extinguisher, but that turned out, I think not to be true. Then the next story was that he he died uh, from getting like bear poison, which is like um, pepper spray on steroids kind of thing in the face. And supposedly he was supposed to die of, of a reaction to that. People do, by the way, die sometimes from this. And he was going to get, um, and the people who did it were going to get charged with murder and blah, blah, blah. And everybody was sure this is how he died. 
And then lo and behold, there's a story in the Washington Post, the medical examiner found that Sicknick died of natural causes. He just happened to die the day after he got it in the face from uh, this, during this riot, this coincidence. And I'm like, well, that's what you get because the ju a jury might have convicted him. They would have seen this gruesome video of getting, uh, being sprayed in the face and whatever it is and say, well, what are the odds that a guy's gonna drop dead right after that and guilty? And here's this amazing coincidence. And I say, well, that's, that's, that's a coincidence. That's a way less difficult coincidence to accept than the fact that somebody died an hour after taking a lethal dose of fentanyl, wherever they happened to be an hour after they took it, under a knee or whatever it is, you know, especially when the guy who was in the car wasn't given um, immunity to test, I think Hall was not given immunity to testify about Floyd's taking of the drugs, what his tolerance might've been, whether or not this was more drugs than he'd taken in the past. A lot of things about this, you know, if we had an ACLU, they'd be saying the kind of things that I'm saying. That's the kind of, these are the kind of things that they used to say in unpopular cases, but they don't say, they don't talk about that stuff anymore. Don't we have an ACLU? We have one, but they're, but they are silent on matters of civil liberties for the most part now. Right. I mean, no, so, so, so for those who, I don't know if that's right. But go on. It, yeah. There was a guy who was in the car with um, Floyd and he was maybe his drug dealer. I don't know. And he took the fifth and, and the prosecution refused to give him immunity to testify. Presumably, because what he might say was not going to help the prosecution's case. But in my opinion, the way I always felt like, well, if I'm on a jury and, I'm, and I know that the prosecution has a witness that they're withholding from me, I'm saying, well, something, this stinks to high heaven. Because I know very well that if this guy was going to help their case, they would have given him immunity in a heartbeat. The ACLU would normally, if this was a Central Park jogger case and there was a witness that was not allowed to testify, uh, everybody'd be like, that's an outrage. How could the prosecutor keep a witness out of this case when somebody was on trial for their lives? But in this case, we're like, well, it's okay because anything is fair game if we're going to convict Chauvin, right? How do you know what the guy was going to say? I'm presuming that. Oh, yeah. So you don't? Well, well I'm, I'm presuming well, with, with strong common sense that if he was going to help well, the case, they would have given him. Perhaps, food. but he might not have helped the case for reasons that have nothing to do with whether the causation was there. It, it could be just that he's not a credible witness. Yeah, but I think you'll agree with me, Professor, that we would all like to see defendants given every uh, benefit of the doubt when they feel there's a witness, human being, who might help prove their innocence. You know, I mean, that's, that's a they're, big thing. They're a big given thing somebody, a reasonable doubt. Yeah. They're given no, a, it's a very big doubt. thing. It's a very, very, very big thing, almost un-American in a way, even though I know it's done and legal, to tell, tell somebody on trial for their life, listen, yes, I know you want that guy to, to say what they saw, well, the defendant, oh, we're not called, the defendant could have called that witness. I, anyway, I, uh, we, we... They did. He took the fifth, I thought. Anyway, okay, yeah. I, so, I don't know. I know we said an hour, but if yes. you could us just a wee bit longer, because we did get a little bit sidetracked. By the way, before the show, Noam literally said, I don't want to talk about Chauvin. Uh, I, I can't help it, because I'm so happy <laughs> to have a, a smart law professor, you know, and I, I, I like to, you know, test my, 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 my dumb thoughts. So, okay. The politics well, of that, sex. And you still said that, though. You knew she was a smart law professor, well, okay, and you were okay. still like, Periel. Okay, Periel. Periel. So, so this, no, is, no this is up your alley. Sexual Pro bureaucracy. The professor wrote a, an article, I think the gist of it, she'll tell us, but the gist is that um, some of these laws regarding uh, the way sex is supposed to operate, sex laws and like social norms and consent and all that, just don't really match up to the way real human beings the mating dance of real human beings. Is that correct? Well, it, I think it depends on who you ask, honestly, because things may be changing. You know, right, I, you, tell us about it. Give us a gist. Yeah, will you summarize for our listeners? Sure. So I'll left. just start. I'll just start <laughs> with. Um, <laughs> I'll just start with um, the idea of consent. Right? What is consent? At the end of the day, when you're talking about the difference between sex that is just sex, you know, and or sex that is sexual assault, right? There's, there's got to be some distinction between those two things, of course. And often the distinction comes down to consent. Was there consent or wasn't there consent? If there wasn't consent, then that wasn't 
that wasn't sex that we generally think is allowable in our society. Um, so basically, it all comes down to how you define what consent is. So in the old days, um, before any of our time really, it used to be that in order for there to not have been consent, uh, a person, usually it was a woman, would have had to resist to the utmost. That was the legal formulation. Resist to the utmost. And then what resistance to the utmost generally meant was that she like had severe injuries, like probably ended up in the hospital. It wasn't enough that she was like had punches and bruises. Um, what resistance to the utmost meant was like, you know, she it was like she had really physically put up a huge fight and then th there would be like evidence to show that that's what resistance to the utmost was um so now we don't think of consent that way um and then the question is how far are we going to go um away from that kind of physical notion of saying no like physically resisting the act um is it and then so during my college years the slogan was no means no right which seems straightforward enough like if if a person says no that means no and you don't go forward um and that was that was what we used to say you know i used to you know do all kinds of uh, feminist advocacy and um you know marches and take back the night and all that and it was always no means no but now you know this many years later 25 years later um no means no is no longer the standard. Um, the standard now is more like if they don't say yes affirmatively, if the person isn't saying yes affirmatively, this is called affirmative consent, then it's not consent. Now, this is not actually, I'm not describing this affirmative consent. I'm not actually describing the criminal law as it stands right now. But there certainly is a lot of advocacy trying to make the criminal standard that affirmative consent standard, like affirmatively, if there isn't um, a manifestation, an expression of an agreement or assent or um, some kind of like, you know, affirmation, then there's no consent. Are, the, are these, so, are these <laughs> university guidelines, like, will these kind of- In general, right now, where it has taken hold is in universities. And so in the last five years, what we've seen is like a very rapid, change in university codes so that you could get you know disciplined or kicked off of campus expelled or you know put on probation or suspended um, for sexual wrongdoing and of course then it matters how the college defines consent and so again a lot of advocacy right now going on around trying to get colleges to adopt this affirmative consent standard and many of them already have what's the criminal so, standard what what does the law say the criminal standard right now doesn't go to affirmative consent usually uh consent is um it, it would it would be like some manifestation of no like saying no or um obviously physically resisting would count although that's not required um so it would be just uh basically the the idea would be that a person has not consented if they have um manifested some resistance whether verbal or nonverbal, um to the act so, so perry yeah let's, let's go around I'm, I'm really curious what do you think about the idea that a man should ask permission? Can I kiss you? Can I do this? It's not, I have to break it to you. It's these standards do not apply only to men. Women also are being disciplined and uh, suspended and things like that for not getting affirmative consent. These are gender neutral standards. And in fact, it would not be okay under federal law and state anti-discrimination law to have a consent standard that only applied to men and not to women. Yeah, but go, go ahead, Perry. I, 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 I agree with that. I didn't mean, I, it, it sounded like I was being flippant, but I had something else in my head, but you're, that's very important that you said that. Go ahead, Perry. So what do you think about that? 
I mean, it's preposterous. Who has sex that way? <laughs> well, but, but, but confirmative consent doesn't have to be verbal, right? I mean, I assume that confirmative, affirmative consent, affirmative can, consent. Be, can be, you know. In, uh, some, in some places, you can manifest your consent affirmatively through acts or words. In other campuses, it must be through words. And soon they're going to have a, have us like sign document saying like I want to give you a blowjob. But, but like, again, what? but again, I want to under I, I underline want to underline that this is not part of the criminal law. This is only on campuses. And my guess is, my guess is, very few people are not being disciplined. Um, you know, under this standard, um, unless it was an extreme case. Uh, I could be wrong. You what's are the wrong. most outrageous? What's the most outrageous? <laughs> you are well, what's the most you outrageous? Right. What's the most outrageous case that you've wait, heard? Wait, wait. Oh, Dan, wait, before I, I, let, let's just get into the the. But I want. I want I mean, a, a good I, question. An outrageous. Well, yeah, it is a good question, but I, but I still. I, let's hold that question. Let's get the because I want to understand. Like I want to. I want to hear so, a female point of view and then a male point of view. Like, does is this the way real life can work? Let's ask is Mike Kaplan. He is about as gentlemanly a gentleman as we could find, and he happens to be right here. We invited him. Okay, so Mike, do you, do you ask, do you think this is realistic? Uh, you know, I think that uh, I have grown a lot in the, you know, the time since my college days when, for sure, this wasn't the standard that, you know, like, the idea that you, I understand, you're like, I, it seems unsexy to be like, let's pause for a moment and make sure that everybody's on this page, but... There are, I understand now, like I listen to Dan Savage's podcast and there are ways in which that like, he talks about, like you can sexually ask somebody, like I'm like to the left of Pariel here, where it's like, you could be like, hey, you know what I want to do to you? And if they're like, no, they're like, okay, great. Like I sincerely, I think it's great to know, to be sure that when you are doing something with someone that they want to be doing it with you and that they are enthusiastic about it. And so... I, I do think that it's not the way that things have always been. I think that uh, teenagers and adults have been like bumbling through, sometimes successfully finding people like without communicating, using their words as fully and being like, well, I guess it ended up okay. But I do think that this is a good standard to aspire to, to like to let younger people know that it is good, like to especially to encourage all genders, but especially women who have been historically like socialized to just uh, assent silently to go along with a man uh, in well, sort of a heteronormative way. No, can uh, I uh, just give you my point of view? First yes, of all, this never came up with for me in college. Um, because I, I was a virgin when I graduated, and I'll go one step further, I hadn't even kissed a girl uh, at that time. Very sad, but we'll, but, but we'll move on from that. But I- Very respectful. <laughs> well, not very respectful. I mean, I wasn't even in a position where this would even an issue. Um, <laughs> Having said that, we really want to hear your opinion. Go ahead. My opinion is <laughs> when, when it comes to kissing uh, and grabbing of, uh, of, of body parts- Kissing and grabbing. <laughs> Um, I will. I will let uh, nonverbal cues guide me. When it comes to the act of sexual intercourse, I will always either ask or wait for them to say, and they often do. They often do. I'm not bragging, but they often do. Scream, <laughs> f me. You know what can I tell you? Um, I wait Just... for one of those two things. I'm sorry, <laughs> Professor, but this is a comedy-oriented podcast, so sometimes we use the same language. Oh, you're just joking. <laughs> so, no, they often, I... Oftentimes, that is either, it's either I will ask or they will say. That, that's often what they say, you know? Um, and I will wait for one of those two. And I, if I don't get that, I will, I will make a verbal ask for the sexual act, for ass-grabbing, Booby grabbing, etc. I will, I will rely on nonverbal cues. I don't know. I kind of really like what Mike said, though, especially. Don't gloss over what, what I said. I just said it. <laughs> what I said was better than what you said. You can say to somebody, Nobody "I really want to kiss you." I really want to kiss you. Can be a sexy thing to say. Uh, yeah, I guess, but no, it's but never, it's, it's never done. It's I don't. True, it's seldom, though. seldom done. He's seldom right. Done. Like girls, you, are... you move slowly forward. And if they if they pivot, then you know, like you just kind of kind of move in, and you you know what I mean. It is kind of, uh, and then you know they 
Dan, you're a comedian. You talk professionally. I believe you could say something. Okay, so so for, first no, of all, no, I, 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 let me let me say, let me say as 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 sexist as as is going to sound. I understand why it has to go in both ways. But in real life, if a guy came to me all upset because a girl tried to kiss him and didn't ask him first, I mean, he would get laughed right out of uh, any any meeting with guys. In because in, in real life, I believe this is not wrong to say. What we are protecting here, or what we're reacting to here, is that overwhelmingly men are 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 stronger and tend to and tend to be uh, uh the violent ones and we're trying to if 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 this problem came about just because of the number of times men were sexually assaulted by women we would never have this policy what we're trying to do here at root is end the mistreatment of women and yes we have to create a gender neutral standard because the law forces us to do that but I think that most of us realize it's not really uh, the same in, in either direction. Men are not scared. Men are assaulting other scared. men as well, no? There's, there are gay relationships. So can I just, can no, I just tell you, somebody, I, so I was asked, what is, what, what is the most outrageous case that I know about? I know I of a few. That. I know of a few, well, but let me tell you about one that is public knowledge. You know, it's not, I, I know a lot from my own legal practice because I do represent people who are accused of things and who are complaining of things in universities. As a lawyer, I, I represent people. But one that I, it, uh, one case I didn't work on, but is that is now it is public. It's in a case. So at Brandeis University, there were two uh, male students who were in a relationship for eighteen months. After the relationship broke up, one of them brought a complaint about the other one, um, his ex boyfriend to the authorities at Brandeis. And um, there were several different um, accusations, but one of them for which he was found responsible for sexual misconduct was the accusation that they showered together often. And in, in one instance, he said his boyfriend had looked at his genitals without his affirmative permission. Stop. So, Come on. Okay. You, I think I'm making it up, but I'm not. It no, really no, nobody is. thinks you're making no, it up. No, I don't think you're making I, I, it up. I don't think you're making it up, but there has to be more to it. No, that, that's almost the same thing. Well, well no I'm telling you, there, there were a few other accusations. Like one of them was he woke him up with a kiss one time, and he, could, he couldn't have affirmatively consented to that because he was asleep. Oh, my right? God. So that was, that was one. And he was found responsible for that as well. What does that mean, found responsible for? Found like, responsible means like, it's like the equivalent of guilty, so that you right, would get Right, 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 but what were the consequences? I mean, what is there like- Oh, he, he got a disciplinary, um, like it was either a suspension or a, you know, he got like something in his file, like he was found responsible. He went on a and, permanent record, as they used to say back in Yes, elementary. exactly. So I, I don't remember whether it was a suspension or some, some other thing. He wasn't expelled for it, but he, he got something um, that disrupted his education. I mean, this is and, insane. So, so let me ask you, let me ask you. Can we get another example that involves a, a female complainant and a male? Yes. Uh, yes, there, there have been situations that I've been in, uh, a lawyer for where Often it happens that the um, it might be like the female complainant brings a case against the male, and then the male. Oh no, it's frozen. Yes, uh, whoops, Jenny, you're you're frozen. Jeannie, Jeannie knows. I mean, I do not affirmatively consent to this. <laughs> Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Tragic. Show up, show up, freeze. Well, what do you all think about that case about the two men? I mean, do you think there's more to the story or it's, is, 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 is that's actually what happened? No, I, I, don't it, think, I don't think there's more to the story. I it, think. Yeah, it, it seems to me that in that situation, like they were in a relationship together and they liked each other. And then when they were out of the relationship, it seems like it was sort of the guy gaming the system, using like the letter of the law 
technically speaking, like, because when people are married, like you can, you know, a thing that would be potentially technically assault, like if you get too drunk, you can get drunk with your partner and have sex if you want to. But if you do that with somebody you don't know, that technically might be assault. So they were doing things. The idea that they were naked in the shower and he looked at his genital, I just have to believe that that can't possibly be the basis for a disciplinary action at Paradise or anywhere else. Hurry up, see if she tried to reconnect. I'm going to research that after the show and I'll oh, have yeah. to talk with you next. Well, this is the thing, that when you create a lot of um, footholds in the law, hooks, um, people will use them in bad faith. This is similar to trip and falls that are bullshit and all sorts of tort cases. You know, you, you create a liability and then um, especially people, you know, you can see it in a love relationship where people are bitter towards each other and they just want to hurt each other and they find, I mean, you see this in divorce law all the time, right? Um, so I, you know, so I believe it. Did she, did she, is she gone? I'm working on it. Did she had, she had enough of Dan, I think. Uh, well, look, I have to, I have to keep it real on some level. Um, but no, you know, I, I thought I brought up an interesting point and no one, basically ignored, basically brushed aside, <laughs> is that I said that I, I, I demand, I require a verbal consent for intercourse. Now, does anybody else have that policy? Anybody else here on the panel? Oh, for sure. No. Right. <laughs> now, Noam back in, of course, Noam's married now, but back in his days, he was, let's not forget, Noam, nerdy though he might seem, plays a mean six string. <laughs> <laughs> and it got a lot of ass back in the day. I, I, don't, I don't understand <laughs> how, how, I mean, I'm trying, I'm, 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 excuse the erection, but I'm playing back in my mind very sexual situations that I had. Um, usually you're kissing, you go over to the bed, you lay down, you're clutching at each other's clothes. I mean, I mean it's not like you just like, take her down and belt. Like, like it's, it happens so, so gradually. There's never any doubt. Okay, but wait yeah, a but second. That, be that as it may, and you may have, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying for me, for me, I need some sort of verbal assent. Why? Why? Because you want to make sure. I want to make double, right. triple sure. Wait, so here's the thing. No, you know, you're, where's the professor? Where's Professor She Gerson? said she couldn't take you anymore. Oh, she didn't say that. Where is she? She's coming back? She, she found you insufferable. No, I don't know where she is. I'm trying to get her back. Look, I hope I she wasn't messed... offended by anything I said. But no. we are talking about... Oh, no, she froze. She had a technical no, she froze. Problem. She'll come back. We are talking, I just about human, maybe, we are talking about human sexuality, and sometimes adult language will be used in that context. No, she's fine. She's great. I this love is her that. no. Let's take her no for an answer. The thing is, Noam, is that you're not taking... You're, you're I'm, you know, assuming that... You know, you've never been in a situation where you're doing something to somebody that they don't want done, right? So you're not allowing that possibility even into the scenario, which is why it seems so absurd to you. Look, you know, nine times out of a hundred. Listen, I, I would say this: the actual intercourse is usually the least, the least ambiguous part of the interaction. In other words. It's the steps that come before that where you're actually taking, the, where, you're, where, you're, where you're more unsure. Like the initial kiss, that is a very unsure thing. Like you, like you hope that she's receptive, but you know, that you, could, you can miscalculate on the initial kiss. The sexual act the initial, has a particular, both legal and psychological um, weight well, to it. Well, I'm saying like when you're, when you're finally both naked on the bed, um, and, and, you know, past the age of, you know, 21, um, it's pretty clear, you know, where this is going. It's before that, like maybe the first time you try to undo the clothing, that where, that's where she might say, no, 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 you know, like, but, but I, again, I don't want to no go one, that far. No but, one's traumatized by somebody trying to undo their clothing. People are traumatized by sex that they didn't really want. So to make, in that spirit, to make, to, to, to just be perfectly... So there's no ambiguity. I myself, and this doesn't happen often because I'm not that sexual, let's face it. But when it does, I um, want some sort of affirmative uh, uh, affirmative consent. And, my, and Mike, you said also that you, that you seek that as well. 
Oh yeah, I, but I also would seek it for uh, kissing and grabbing, as you said. Uh, and but perhaps I, I have a question for the professor. Is she coming back? Because I, I have. A, I don't know, honey. I she's not answering me. I mean, it's possible. But so, so Mike, before you kiss a, a new woman, I assume Mike, once you've already kissed a woman, you're in a relationship. You don't ask for permission each time. I, I gather. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm in a, a relationship of about five years, and we do not. Uh, we're not as explicit in uh, the to the letter of the law of the college uh, well, rules it, these days. Girl, yes. Are you telling me, Mike, with any new girl, and it's been five years, I'm assuming you're not cheating, but with any new girl, are you telling me that before you kiss her, you say, can I kiss you? Uh, late, I, I would say, I mean, in the more recent years of my life, I would be more likely to do that, yes. There's something about what Mike's saying, though, that really resonates with me, which is young women are not historically taught, and young girls, when they're first starting to hook up with people, they are sort of, you know, you just go along with it, right? Like, you're just sort of pushed along into this thing. So I think the teaching them to speak out and teaching you, young I, men. My experience with women is they have no problem speaking out. I, uh, I, you know, I, I remember I heard a story. Beat it, but maybe that's just me. There, there are stories I've heard of like, you know, teenagers, uh, you know, teenagers having sex where they're both kind of not communicating about it. I don't think that, I don't think that, uh, people are the best communicators in general about sexual things. Like, I don't think that everyone gets a great sex education. I don't think that it's uh, taught well. Like, I, I think there's great resources out there, but you know, this society is so sex negative and sort of sex phobic that people are like, ah, oh, you'll just, you'll figure it out. It'll be fine. You just, you just feel it out. You feel yeah. around, like well, you, well, you'll get it. You'll know, but that's not so. Yeah, sex education, right. When you talk about sex education, the mechanics of sex are easy enough. Are you talking about educating people on, on being assertive? Yay. Thank goodness, you're I'm back. back. <laughs> I'm back, so sorry about that. I don't know what happened. That's okay. <laughs> um, so what, we, we're, so what, we're, did you, what did you conclude about affirmative consent? Well, I, I, uh, Noam, Noam, I revisited my personal policy of, of, of uh, requiring or uh, asking for some sort of uh, um, uh, uh, like you're a flight attendant in an emergency row. When, when it comes to intercourse, but not when it comes to, generally speaking, the preliminaries. Uh, Mike asks for permission, even with the preliminaries, and no, I'm, don't give a damn. He just go in and do it. And I've oh. revised my position because oh. I, I think that it's good to teach younger kids that they, you know, should use their voices and say what's okay and not okay. That's another argument, though. Well, yeah. I don't know, but I, but I also do think it's not that, I'm not really sure that's the way that people have sex with each other, you know, like in a natural you're, you're, setting. You're, you're, but you're bringing up two separate Well, look, can, can, I, can I say- Do you think it will change? Do you think it will topic? change that people will have sex that way, like over time, the more we talk about it this way? I do. What do you uh, think? What what what's your position? But I, I still want to hear an outrageous story about a woman <laughs> that complained about a guy, uh, you know, doing something without. Uh, um... Periel, will you complain about Dan real quick? <laughs> <laughs> do you have Do you have a, a story that comes to mind, Professor? Yes, I mean, I I, I have had I have known of cases where. Um, uh, and a man felt a college a college student felt that um, he had tried to break up with the girlfriend, and the girlfriend uh, didn't want to break up, and you know, and you know started to engage in sexual acts, you know, namely go down on him, and. Um, and he, he felt that this was, uh, he had not affirmatively consented. And so, and he felt violated. Now, is that an outrageous story or is that just, you know, that's what that is, well, that's is beyond that, outrageous. Well, that is, that is oh, yeah. outrageous. Yes. But it's you not feel what it's I, outrageous. I was about it. What? You feel it's outrageous to complain, for the guy to complain what, to the authorities? Like start to finish blowjob and then he complained that he didn't want it. 
Right. Right. Yeah, no. Well, like, sorry, that doesn't go like that. So, so. I mean, if listen. she started to do it and he pushed her away, like, okay, that's a different story. But if they had, like, an entire session in which she performed fellatio on him and he, I'll be polite, you know, finished. All right. And then he completely. Well, he had to have finished? He had to have finished for you to be outraged? <laughs> <laughs> he had to have finished for me to, and then to complain about it is what I'm saying would be outrageous. It's, outra it's outrageous even if he pushed her away. All right. So, so listen, so, so, let me, so let me just no, ask. You're misunderstanding. Well, I understand. We know we got you. Well, you're, you're on, saying if he finished, he has no right to complain. I'm hold saying on. he has no right to complain under any circumstances. Hold on. <laughs> Mike, what do you think? So uh, th thank you. Thank you for asking. I, I have a personal story that's sort of related and uh, touches on something that Noam was talking about earlier too. sort of complaining about like the binary nature of these things. Like it's not necessarily as binary as like somebody did something wrong and somebody did something uh, like who is correct. Like when I was when I was in college, I was working at a summer camp and I was hooking up with a woman who I'd like hooked up with a couple times, but we we hadn't had sex and we were like just fooling around and like in like a very swift move she like uh pulled my shorts off and like i had never had sex from like behind before and i that she just like made it happen without a condom and it happened real fast and i it felt good but i afterwards was like that was not the my favorite way for things to go and there are elements where I'm like the guy in that story where I'm like, I don't, th I wouldn't say that she assaulted me, but I do not think that I, I certainly didn't verbally consent to what happened. I certainly didn't want to do it without a condom. Like I wouldn't have wanted to, but it was happening so fast and I didn't feel like that I was able to. And maybe there were some like macho, like, you know, toxic masculine ideas of like, I'm supposed to want this. I'm supposed to be doing this like who am i to think and uh, that i shouldn't be doing this but all of those things were conflicts that were within me and i just like i i told her that i later like the next day i was like i didn't i didn't want to do this without a condom and i was like worried about disease and pregnancy and i was scared and like so we kind of like broke up because i was like i my, my, i felt a violation of a kind are you telling us just so i'm clear here that she forced you to have sex with, to, to do her from behind? Uh, essentially, uh, I, I wouldn't use the word force, it's but she force. It finessed it. It was not consensual. It was yeah. not consensual in the sense of affirmative consent or really even, I mean, it was just, it, it happened silently without you saying yes or no. And under today's affirmative consent uh, standards, if you felt violated and you went and complained, Yes, she would have technically violated the rules, and it, in fact, it wasn't it wasn't wanted. I mean, the, the standard often in colleges is, did you want it? The wantedness, the welcomeness is an, an important concept these days. And so are the rest of you saying that you don't think that such a claim should be vindicated? Well, you know my position with regard to how I operate. I'm very, very clear that I want consent, but I don't understand how a woman makes a guy do her from behind, I mean. Yeah, yeah. I, I, this, this, is, this is a couple of things. Well, he's telling you that that happened. It's not like forcible, but it was not consensual. Yeah, well, um, I was behind her, Dan, and uh, you were participating. Certain motions. I'm not saying that I wasn't participating. So then, so then, so then you. So, so this is the thing. There's a few things I, I'm, I'm trying to get in here. First of all, at some point you'll take responsibility for your own actions. You, if you're participating in a sexual act. You're participating in a sexual act, number one. Number two, not everything that happens between couples needs an institution of law or order or university to, to adjudicate. We definitely need uh, someone to step in when, some, when a crime is committed, when somebody is forced to do something, whatever it is. We don't necessarily need that when somebody makes an error of judgment that they regret the next day. And uh, number three, a lot of these cases, at least maybe just because they're the most interesting ones to listen to, maybe not actually the ones that matter, sound like, you know, sour grapes between people who have long relationships and maybe there's some bitterness and resentment and they're kind of marshalling the law or whatever, you know, whatever procedures they can to get even 
with um, each other in the same way people throw the kitchen sink at each other in divorce court and stuff like that and accuse each other of all kinds of horrible things. So these would be my worries. But here's another question I have is, in, 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 in most cases, we're like first and most primary worried about the, the, the terrible times that people have been forced to have sex, right? But the thing is, if you're forced and somebody asks you for consent, I've always wondered this. Are you really going to say no if you're scared? Like, like how, much, how much more does it get you? Like, if you're scared, a man's overpowering you, whatever it is, if, 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 how much more is the question going to change your answer if you feel this tremendous intimidation or pressure to have sex? I've always wondered about that. Oh, it, it's still bad to assault people, even if you ask them for consent. That's and no, you scare I mean, them into course, giving it. You're, no, you're, I hope you're not. I hope you're just kidding. Of course, it's terrible to assault people, but I'm wondering. Well, if, an important part of this, right, I would say. I, I'm just wondering in real life, what 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 is what's being accomplished here? No. Yeah, is is it is that actually protecting people? That's what I'm wondering. Right, right. No, I think I think you know I I hear what you're saying. I think you're saying. If we have an affirmative consent standard and we're, and we're not going to consider it consent unless you say yes, is it actually going to do anything to prevent sexual assault in that do we really think people who are intimidated and feeling like there's a huge power dynamic or like they're, they're scared, are they really going to be able to speak up at that moment? I mean, is it going to prevent sexual assault really? I think that that is a fair question. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I really wonder. Wait, 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 let, me, let me say one more thing to follow up with that I'll hold that thought. So because as a dad, I have a daughter. And, as I, and I, as I weigh all these things, and obviously whatever anybody must think about me, you must know I don't want my daughter to ever have any kind of trauma. Uh, I want her to have a happy and healthy sex life without trauma. Just your daughter, though. And, and I think that the most important thing for that is, is going to be us teaching her to speak up for herself and not feel pressured to, to say no, to not get herself into it. Because that seems to be, there seems to be either it's an actual physical intimidation or just a psychological pressure that women seem to, to buckle under, which men may have trouble understanding, but it's clearly real because you hear enough stories to know that it's real. And to somehow to raise our daughters to not feel that they have to do this because i don't think if she has that feeling if the guy says can i she's yeah. still gonna feel like she has to say yes even you know and then and then he's gonna be able to say you see she said yes yeah i mean it's yeah, sure. it's it's difficult for me to wholeheartedly agree with noam on anything but i really do think that that that's the thing what he just said i mean i really do think that teaching girls that they don't have to do things that they don't want to do that they don't feel pressure to do things because the guy wants to do it or the guy's gonna like them more or whoever they're with is gonna like them more but i really do i mean i've had sexual experiences in the past where i've been like oh i kind of wish i didn't do that or whatever or i kind of wish that but it's like you you can't then take that and turn it around and you know file a complaint with like my university i mean how the hell was he supposed to know that you know i sort of wish that like i didn't give that you know blue job or whatever is, is it, it is. really possible to teach people to, I yes guess can be done so to teach people to assert themselves i mean yeah sure. i don't assert myself how many times have i done a gig I, they say can you do 10 minutes for free for this charity <laughs> and i like, oh, and i did I, right. so well, I can't assert myself and i'm a grown man i i think it that's why it's also that. important to teach men and to teach all the genders like to teach men to is it not to, to, or to is it something that's an innate part of your personality oh, no, you're right you're right mike you're right you're right teach you're right. the men to invite a no when they're to, to teach the men to not put the pressure teach yeah. in the heteronormative situation to teach women to teach girls to not feel pressured but also to teach the other people involved the other half of the equation yeah. to not no, apply the pressure 100 percent. and what, what happened to you i mean is terrible and you know i i don't doubt that you felt violated 
or that you didn't want to do that. And now, now I'm as outraged by no, 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 Come no. on, Ariel. I'm sorry. <laughs> Honestly, can I tell you something? I, I actually think it belittles the cause that we're actually concerned about, which is terrible things that happen to women, to consider Mike Kaplan's un, unconsented doggy style sex as an example of what, I mean, this is so far afield. No, it's not, you're wrong, really you're wrong, you're wrong. That's not true, it doesn't at all. I think that the point uh -huh. is, is that also my, my my thought is that like, you know, I'm guessing you guys were teenagers or something, like that girl also probably didn't really know for exactly why we're saying is because you didn't say anything, right? And you didn't feel like you could say anything. Yes, but, but I. Anyway, so let me, Leslie. We got to wrap it up. Let me leave you with one thought. And I get the professor. Well, I mean, we, we we are we are verging in the law. No, I'm. You're silencing me. Please I'm go sorry. on. <laughs> oh no no no! I, I'm that so, I'm I'm a comedian. Please continue. We're, I'm 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 uh, figuratively giving it to you in the ass right now. Uh, <laughs> I <laughs> oh, consent. Oh, sorry, sorry. We'll cut that out, professor. Um, uh, no, no. <laughs> we we seem to be getting into the law, the, the, moving with the law into areas where we're really not sure uh, if human nature will not have the upper hand. Like, in other words, we all, there is a certain programmed mating dance in every male. There are certain cues and things. And it's quite unlikely, no matter what we say or do, that we're going to really reprogram what humans have found hot in sexual situations, including... The two people look at each other's eyes and are overcome with passion and 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 unite similarly. And I don't I I don't know what the answer is. This we have all these rules now against um, you know romances in the workplace. But the fact is, I guarantee you, in the Biden White House right now, there's at least five affairs going on that are not supposed to be going on amongst the, the, the crowd and milieu of people who are most outraged by this kind of thing in the, in, in the workplace. And at some point, these laws, and maybe it's just we have to live with it, are just setting us up for a lot of people, um, good people getting in trouble, you know, because, because you just, you're not going to have people working together day in, day out and not hooking up. You're just not going to have it. It's just not going to happen no matter how much you make it illegal. And like, like Bill Gates was accused. He asked this girl out and she said no. And he said, well, forget it ever happened. I, I don't know. Like, are you, are you going to be able to really stop that from happening? Do you know how many, as a boss, can I tell you, you know how many times an employee in my life has sidled up to me and wanted to date me or gone out or written well, me? You married one of them, as if memory serves. Yeah, I married one of them. I'm saying like, <laughs> this is... So, so it's just an interesting so once, thing to me yeah. that we're, we're almost at the point now where we're going to try to rewire human nature through laws. And there's going to be a lot of bad outcomes from that. But maybe, you know, in the greater good, we're going to, you know, it's the right thing to do. But I'm skeptical. Professor, I think I we're but, doing it through education as well. And I think that yeah, is the oh, way. You know, we pretend that education is working. But, but it's, that's why I say, like, all those people- You're the one who's talking about your law education. Is it not working? Look, look, at, look at all the Cuomos who are out there talking about, yes, no means no, and we have to believe all women, blah, blah, blah. It's all for show. And then they're behind closed doors. They're all, you know, being boorish and all this stuff. All the two Cuomos? You no, know, I'm saying that there's a lot of people saying stuff, claiming to be on board with this. But in their private lives, they're hooking up with the girl in the cubicle next door. That's all I'm saying. The professor, I don't know. I'm sure there's like, there's still professors going sleeping with students. There's still law professors sleeping with each other. <laughs> there's still administration. It's always going to happen. It's, it's not going to stop. Go ahead, professor. So a few years ago at my school, we did have this debate about whether we needed to make it actually against the rules to, for professors and students, any teacher and any, any student of any kind, you know, even if they're not your student. Um, to make that just against the rules. And we, you know, we had a big contentious debate about it and, and the school did ultimately vote to make that illegal at our school. So what <laughs> um, is, no and, professor can sleep with any student of any Yeah, or date or have any kind of romantic interaction with what any about student. A grad student that doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. It could be a student who's older than you. It could be like a 10th year PhD student doesn't matter. Um, we're not, that's not uh, no longer allowed. 
Um, but you know, some a lot of people in in my profession did marry their students at one time. Um, not well, not even that long ago. To to academia, if they can't have sex with their students, let her finish. Well, let her finish. That's not you know. It used to be maybe that back in the day that was one of the perks of the job. That is no longer considered a perk of the job. Um, so I I guess what I I one thing that I agree with you on Noam is there 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 are certain ways in which you if you make a rule over inclusive so that almost everybody who's having sex is technically in violation of it and i do believe that if you have a verbal affirmative consent policy pretty much like almost everybody who's having sex like very few are actually complying with it because these consent policies say for every single thing like touch your this part of your body touch your that part it's not just like one blanket consent that's going to work it's like for every step of the way people aren't really doing that. It, it'd be the rare couple that's actually doing that. So then what that means is everybody is violating, but not everybody's gonna get in trouble. Right. You said a lot of people know, only a few select people will get in trouble. And what I worry about is the impact on people who are already marginalized or already um, like seen as suspect, you know, people of color or men of color or, you know, like immigrants or people who don't, or, you know, people who might have like, you know, Asperger's or, um, you know, don't read social cues right or whatever, you know, so it's just, it's not that all of us are going to get in trouble. It's that only a few of us are. And that selection is probably going to have some systematic bias against people who already are pretty disadvantaged in a university setting. And that's here, what I worry here, about. Here. And by the way, you, you touched on something, maybe it'd be another time to have another conversation about it, but it's like a pet, uh, a pet thing of mine, I always think about it, is that these people who don't read social cues in life, which I believe is very likely a genetic thing, yeah, people are disadvantaged in everything. They they can't. These are the people who get in trouble in sexual situations. They try to kiss. They have no indication that the girl has no interest whatsoever. Where another guy who can read social cues just never gets in trouble because. He, he doesn't try to kiss a girl unless it's, he's correct that she wants to kiss him back. And these people innocently go around trying to be happy, trying to engage with, and, but in every aspect of their lives, people who can't read social cues are tremendously disadvantaged and get, the, and get in trouble all the time. And I would also say that I think, I think I would have voted that the professors cannot have sex with students. I think that's, that one yeah. I would say is, is correct. It's Professor common just, sense, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, you know, if, if it's that bad, then one of you needs to drop out, you know, but. Or just wait. Or just wait, yeah. Wait till well, they waiting, graduate. Four waiting years? Is, waiting is not realistic. Nobody can wait. <laughs> Don't you know nobody can wait? Have you, ever been, have you ever been in a relationship where you tried to wait? It doesn't yes. work. Yes. It doesn't work. <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> it doesn't work. And what we most, and, and, well, go ahead. I mean, just, if everybody would just deal in good faith too, like in all these things, I'm, as a, we said this when you got um, cut off, but like on a restaurant. And what happens is a law, which is well intended, like people who are negligent should be responsible for the injuries that happen from the negligence. As a restaurant owner, you know, 90 times out of a hundred, they're just ways for somebody to try to get money from me or get me in trouble or get even with me or, or get even because they were unhappy with something, you know because bad faith ruins everything. And, and it's kind of what I'm reading in some of these sexual cases. Like, it's not that we don't want people who are abused to have recourse. It's that when you hear all these stories about couples that he, you know, somebody I've been showering with for years, all of a sudden he looked at my genitals and now we're getting the law involved. It's like, you know, this is just- Not the law, the campus uh, bureaucracy. Well, and, and, you know, and perhaps he would want the law to be able to get involved if possible. I'm going, I'm going to research that story about the- You can't have a good thing if you don't have people, um, when I say good thing, I mean a positive thing for society if people are not acting in good faith. Anyway, we should end there, Noam. Uh, unless anybody else has something that they're burning to say. I, I, I will just add one thing. I mean, bad faith, good faith, yes. But sometimes I think that there's a whole other hour we could do on the idea that sometimes people don't always know exactly what they want in the moment. Yes. And then afterwards, they know a little better that what the, that they didn't want it in the moment. It wasn't as clear to them in the moment. Well, so I think they wanted it in the moment. And then when the moment is over, they... But that's bad. That's but idea. that's bad faith. I mean, that's bad faith. But I guess what I'm saying is, there's, there's just, 
sometimes there's ambivalence around sexuality all around and you don't quite know what you want. And Mike, in the experience you had, maybe it was clear to you in the moment that you didn't want it. Maybe it wasn't that clear. And, um, and so I think that just the idea of that there's this clear cut distinction between good faith and bad faith can also be, you know, it, it, I, I doubt that sometimes that it's you, you know, that there's confusion. Right. And then you have these rules that you can fall back on. Right, but if there's confusion, right, then you can't just turn around and go back and like blame that other person then either, right? That doesn't seem entirely fair either. It, it may not be fair, but it may be that you're, you're, you know, the way human minds work, it may be that like you weren't sure in the moment, but then as time goes on, you become more convinced right. sincerely. Right sincerely not in bad faith sincerely convinced that you were violated uh, yeah, absolutely uh, uh, very interesting uh, um where, where, where that you wrote this uh, the bureaucracy of sex this was a a law review article for harvard law review is that it it was it's called the sex bureaucracy i wrote it um um it's in the california law review but all there's a, like a version in the chronicle of higher education um uh, that's uh, shorter listeners uh the chronicle of higher education wherever chronicles are sold you can buy that and read all about the politics of sexual bureaucracy on campus. We thank our very special guest. I just, by the way, read on your Wikipedia article that you were born in Seoul, South Korea. I was. Uh, but you obviously came as a very young person because you have no accent of any kind. I came when I was six years old and spent a year in Youngstown, Ohio, which is where I, I got my completely neutral American accent. <laughs> well, that's as undiverse a place as I can think of. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for coming, Professor Gerson. Yeah, I'm sorry, can I, I'll leave you with this. Uh, Camille Paglia, who I know is a very controversial figure in feminist circles, but she's a, a, a provocative writer. She said something, she said, sex is a dark, dangerous force of nature. And I think that's exactly right. And, and so everything that you're saying about this ambivalence and ambiguity and regrets and good faith, bad faith, it's, it's all true. It's all true in various times. The only thing that I, I'm going to call bullshit on is the <laughs> fact that Mike Kaplan was actually abused. <laughs> oh, come on. If, you, if it had just been you were on the bottom, I could have given <laughs> it to you, Mike. You know, we, but being, in, being back, being in control of the event, I'm sorry, I'm laughing you out of Dwarman Court. Okay, Professor Gerson, it was a pleasure to, to meet and, you. Of course, you are welcome to, anytime you're in here to stop by and discuss this or other things with us in person. Mike Kaplan, bye. I would love to have you at the Comedy Cellar, Professor. You're, do you ever come to New I would love it. Yes, I would love oh it. Oh my God, Perry L, pick it up. AKA is his latest and greatest Thank you, Dan. Album. If I may just real quick also say, Noam, I hope that your home life improves. <laughs> okay, thank you. And we will see you on our podcast at ComedyCellar.com for questions, comments, suggestions. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.